I suppose just over the next number of minutes, I'm just going to, I suppose, just do a, I suppose, a parish um, a helicopter view of the museum and all that we do and trying to put the collection into some type of context and that type of thing. What I'm going to highlight, I suppose, are just some of the items that take my fancy, just they intrigue me, they inspire me, um, they motivate me. Um, they're not, they're, I, I suppose it's an eclectic mix um, and it's just, I suppose, a recurring feature. And I was just thinking about this earlier today was that the beauty of the collection that we have, and we have something perhaps over like approximately between 70 and 80,000 items that we actually physically have on the premises. And it's just such a rich and diverse collection that to ask somebody what their favorite item is, is akin to asking a parent, which is your favorite child? And go on, you know you have one. And so we won't tell anybody and, and that type of thing. So what I'm just going to do is, I suppose, just highlight some of the items that I think are interesting. And I suppose we say just the recurring theme was sort of why I think that they're important. And I suppose ultimately it's a case that to how we use the collection is probably to try and tell a story. And perhaps if I start with probably one of the greatest storytellers of all time, probably one of the greatest Irish stories of all time, um, I want to start with Brian Freel. Uh, in translations and there's a quote there that says that it is not it's not the literal past the facts of history that shape us but images of the past embodied in the language and I th I've used this quote uh, on a number of occasions because I just I find it it's keep on coming back to it because I just think that there's so much in it and I think particularly from a museum perspective that the um, it's not so much that the images of the past but the actual items of the past that they, so I suppose, when we're telling stories, we hear, or if we hear something on the radio or we see something from the past, it evokes a strong memory, it evokes, it evokes strong emotions that we try maybe sort of if we're with family or friends, children, grandchildren, that type of thing, that we just try and tell the story about that. I remember the day when, and the funny thing about it is I was just trying to find an actual proper image to actually accompany this particular quotation. And I came across this map um, and obviously it's directed by Adrian Dunbar, the presentation is done by Adrian Dunbar. But the people of a particular age might actually recognize the strong image. It's obviously a map. It's a jigsaw map. It's something from the, we say the 70s and 80s, something that we say children would have used just to establish their, I suppose, familiarity with the, with the geography of Ireland and that. And it's, it's based on a John Hind image from what I can remember. So you can see there's the likes of Mount Errigal, there's Ben Bulban, there's the Cliffs of Moher, there's uh, Bruna Buena and, and such like. But one of the beauties of it was that to help children actually identify either locations, right, be they counties or attractions, the names were actually taken out. And so you could actually sort of use it as a, we say, a quiz with a child or a bunch of children being in the classroom or the, in the sitting room. And I think sort of that this is sort of something that we've been trying to do over the last number of years in the museum, try to evoke, I suppose, not so much an intellectual um, recognition or reaction from, from a visitor, because sort of you expect that. But sometimes I think it's the case that we say that if you can also capture the emotion of the, the moment, or the emotional significance of a particular item, I think sort of it actually, because ultimately, because human beings, we don't re readily real, uh, rely on our, um, on our intellect. Sometimes we actually just obviously go with our emotions, as I think there's not, uh, sometimes we, we procrastinate, but then sort of sometimes we just make a decision on a whim. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the workings of Homer. Um, but obviously the philosopher had a son called Bart. Not many people knew that. And I came across this quote and I think it just comes, I think it's hugely important because he says, Bart says that museums are our hallowed halls of culture, but don't hold that against them. They demand respect. Okay, that's fair enough. And so the next time you get dragged into one of the, these dusty old dumps, remember to behave. I came across that when, actually when Donald uh, mentioned there when I was joint education officer in the museum, many years ago at the start of the millennium and it actually started as sort of that's our basic point that or my basic point that sort of that's not so much the reverence in that 
it's actually sort of the, this is the opportunity to engage with the past in a way that's slightly different. Um, and it's not so much to behave and to be quiet, but actually to interrogate and to quizzle and to ask questions of the collection of the guide or whatever. And that's something that we see maybe on our, those of you who are familiar with our ground floor exhibition. The beauty of it is that so little or so few of the actual items on display are behind glass. The idea, and this is all pre-COVID, was that if it's not behind glass, you can lift it, you can feel it, you can actually feel how cold the cast iron is. You can feel the weight of these items that were used to, um, we say, for agricultural purposes or for, we say, for um, in, a, in, in a blacksmith or some type of industrial um, uh, procedure, particularly for something as beautiful as a collection of um, of shoes of, towards the, the tail end of the, of the gallery to heighten, sort of get an idea of how people played football the idea how fashion, we say, returns and comes back and how fashion is cyclical. Because one of the things that we have there was um, a um, stiletto with a, glass, uh, with a glass heel. So this is sort of the basic starting point for everything that we've been doing over the last, well, since the start of the millennium. I take responsibility for that. So over the next few minutes, I'm just going to highlight our mission statement and give you a bit of bi uh, background by way of the museum and how it started and how it's come to be. Give you an overview of the collection and highlight some of which are the temporary and permanent exhibitions that we have on display. And talk also obviously about the artifacts, the selection process, why they're some are accepted and what are our favorites. I often think that the, um, the mission statement for us is, should also be sort of, if you're humming something along the lines of land of hope and glory or whatever, it's, it's something that we say, um, I suppose, inspirational. So the purpose of the museum is to inspire. And I think that's important uh, to inspire famili familiarity with the past through the collection, conservation and communication of Laos cultural history and its wider community. And so therefore, not, we don't stop at the county boundaries. We go to wherever Loud, a member of Loud's community is. So that could be, as we say, like, it could be California. It could be uh, Pakistan. It could be South Africa. It's wherever. It's just how the people, how our um, diaspora have spread out their wings and what they brought back to, um, brought back to County Loud, the insights, the lessons, the knowledge. So... The background to the museum itself is first and foremost is that we're a county museum. Our collection policy is for County Louth. We have what they call designation status, and that's hugely important. It means that we are one of one, a very few select museums in the country that can accept items on behalf of the National Museum. As important as that, we can actually show and exhibit items from the National Collection that they have in, we say, in the likes of in Dublin that they might either have on display or in storage, and we can actually put these on display in the museum itself. We're the only one in the county, and we're only, we say, one of, I think it's one of 12 in the country that can do that. And we're also a participant in the Heritage Council's MSPI. So that's the um, Museum Standards Programme for Ireland. Effectively, it's the sectoral um, ISO 9000. So here's an aerial view of the, um, of the museum uh, in the dim and distant past. As you can see here, there's we see the industrial chimney that was probably about 165 foot high, and was actually could be was visible from Dundalk Bay. The campus, for, and I think this is actually from either the linen factory or the distillery, was I believe about 10 acres in size. It started off, and what I think is actually hugely important about the building is the fact that it goes through a variety of phases of industrial output and production. So we start off with linen factory. From there became a distillery, Malcolm Brown. It was a bonded warehouse uh, owned and operated by PJ Carroll's in this most recent manifestation or iteration. And then what happened was that as public fashion was changing in relation to tobacco and the use of tobacco, um, PJ Carroll's decided that they didn't need those premises. So they graciously gave to Dundalk, Town, Urban, you know, Dundalk Urban District Council at the tail end of the 80s, we're going to give you this on, behalf, on, the, on the context of the proviso that you turn this building into a, a heritage and interpretive centre, because they were all the things at the rage at that particular time. We're talking about 88, 89, 90 or thereabouts. Somewhere along the line, thankfully, 
somebody equated a heritage centre and a museum. Uh, so like basically they're all the same. No, they're not obviously. And thankfully they made somebody made that confuse that made that error and brought us what I believe is one of the finest county museums in the country. I say that because so much of what we actually do and have done and inherited was done before my arrival. In actual fact, a friend of mine got married in August 1999 in the Newmore. Uh, I got married in uh, Drada and um, the reception was in the Newmore. I happened to come to Dundalk the following day to visit some, some, some relations in that. And I was told, you must go down and see the museum. So I did. And prophetically, I wrote in the, in the, the visitor's book, um, excellent, one of the best museums I've ever been in. Um, I didn't expect that we say within, within nine months I'd actually be working there. But there you go. I got to say something nice. This is the bonded warehouse in, of PJ Carroll's. And as you can see, just in the background there, there's a sort of a white, I won't say prefab, but um, office space. And that's where the customs are, the, the, the customs were based. If you keep an eye on those two red doors, those two arches, you should be able to see them in this photograph here, um, in between the two pillars. The reflection is deliberate because it actually just try, I'm trying to indicate or show just how much of the building has changed and how much has actually been retained. What I would actually argue is that this is probably item and artifact number one. You're talking about a magnificent warehouse building, a magnificent, uh, magnificent um, museum. To give you an idea, I mentioned that we have about 70 to 80,000 items in the collection. We're talking about 46,000 of those have been, um, have been catalogued. So we have details and knowledge recorded on 46,000 on a computer database. The remainder are all, have all been physically recorded, sort of uh, painstakingly uh, using pen and paper. Of those, we say we're talking about roughly about three quarters have been our donations and 3,900 of those are loans. So the loans are primarily from the Old and Dock Society, from the, yourselves in the Archaeological Society and the National Museum. So that makes up roughly about half of those, uh, half of those loans. By industry or sector, you're talking about, we say 4,000 come from the, we say the likes of PJ Carroll's. So what really is the case of what really uh, emphasizes here is that the, um, it's an industrial exhibition. I suppose ultimately Dundalk is an industrial town, County Louth is an industrial county, and that's reflected in, in what we have on display. Uh, then sort of like McArdle Moore then, obviously 321, so that's touching on the brewing. Archaeological items, we've got a strong archaeological tradition, which is on our second floor. And then again, sort of a huge amount of photographs, over 4,000 or so. The shipping, we've 4,000 items pertaining to shipping, an awful lot of them are actually shipping records that were given to us or in, in excess of uh, 20 years ago. And then again, sort of, but again, you can see here the importance and the primacy of the industrial, uh, the, the, the area's industrial heritage. As an overview, we've got three galleries of permanent exhibition. We have two spaces dedicated to uh, temporary exhibitions. Um, we cover the archaeological record of the of the of the um, of the county going back to the arrival of the, the hunter gatherers on our second floor, first floor. We talk about the arrival of Christianity coming up to the present day, and then ground floor. We're talking about our industrial exhibition. Um, just to give you an overview of some of the we say the, the highlights that we've had over the last number of years, in 2012 to mark the uh, the London Games. We um, had an exhibition marking the uh, entitled Patriot Games Ireland and the Olympics. That's maybe slightly. One of the things, though, that we actually included in that was actually a focus on each of the of, on each of the Olympias, Olympiads, which had a local um, representation. And one of the things that actually came out of that was the um, RD's Beatrice Hill Law. Now, possibly some of you might be familiar with her in that she was the first woman, uh, the first Irish woman to ever win a medal at the Olympics. She won at the 1908 Games in, um, in London in archery. Now, the interesting thing about her is that she 
because that was the first competition for women, or so I've been led to believe, that they actually presented, uh, instead of going gold, silver, and bronze, they actually went bronze, silver, and gold. So to the best of my knowledge, the first woman to ever receive an Olympic medal in the modern day Olympics was from our day. Now, as it happens, they went, as that, exhib as that exhibition was running, in October of that year, there was a, um, an auction and held of sporting memorabilia. And coincidentally, and uh, coincidentally, Beatrice's Olympic medal was actually one of the items that was up for um, was up for auction, as well as a number of other items belonging to her. And uh, we were in the fortunate position where we could actually make a bid and we were actually successful. So we do actually have Beatrice's uh, medal on display and I'll show it to you later. Probably the most important exhibition that we've done in the last number of years was that in, to mark the, uh, the centenary of the rising in, in 1916. And this is, we say, called Birth of a Nation, um, the evolution of Irish nationhood, 1641 to 1916. This was an amazing experience for us for one main particular reason. We had an original copy of the Proclamation of Independence. Now the running joke amongst ourselves was that we actually probably spent longer planning the exhibition than the leaders of the Rising actually spent planning the Rising. Um, but it was probably one of the most rewarding projects that we've ever been involved in, just the actual collection of items that we had on display. For the most part, unfortunately, they were loan. But that's that was on, that's just the just the hop of the ball. But we had items associated with each and every one of the leaders. We had um, items associated, we say, with the likes of Daniel O'Connell, Robert Emmett, because we were trying to tell the narrative or of how when we say in 1641 when Oliver Cromwell, or sorry, the um, when we had the uh, the the rising in Ulster um, in October 1641 then going on to Cromwell in 1649, and then sort of just how the ebb and flow of the notion of the Irish Republic was, I suppose, articulated and um, ultimately was it came its ultimate realization, I suppose, in 1916. I suppose ultimately, I can't forget though, amongst all of this is the importance of Irish involvement in, you said, the likes of the world in the world in World War One. Dundalk is a garrison town, obviously. So this was a particular exhibition that we had called Their Story: Ireland, the Salmon Nineteen, and World War One, which we had in um, we opened in in um, at the tail end of twenty sixteen. What you see there in the middle is actually the a wood an original wooden propeller that was held in one of the offices and back houses in Dundalk up until I think probably the 1970s, 1980s or thereabouts. The person who owned it, um, his son, I believe was one of the, we say, was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to fly and unfortunately died in a plane crash before he actually ever saw action in the First World War. But this is, I believe is, I think sort of a propeller from a Sopwith Camel. Uh, it was just an absolutely amazing exhibition and just sort of ran a very good contact, uh, was very complimentary um, and gave great contrast and context to the um, to our 1916 exhibition. So when we're accepting an item or somebody is looking to give us a donation, what is the criteria? So I suppose first and foremost, we go back to our mission statement. How does it pertain to actually under, our knowledge of and developing knowledge of County Louth? or its people. Secondly, and obviously, is it already in the collection? Do you need a duplicate? Or is it a case of sort of, we say, if you have one already, then that's, that might, might uh, allow us to actually sort of, okay, at least we've got one plus a copy in case something happens to the original. But do we need a third or a fourth or a fifth? The likelihood is probably no. Obviously, something as simple as what condition is it in? because it's no use taking something that's completely rusted and for, really to, to fall apart because you really need items that you can actually put on display. And then obviously, can you or will you actually use the item? Because it's basically, it's no use to actually accepting an item unless you're actually going to use it. 
Um, the artifacts from our perspective have to be important as well, because I think sort of there's the whole principle of telling a story and telling a story that's coherent. Now, Tom Kenny, who's a, I suppose, a general man about town in Galway, he, um, he writes a column every week called the Old, Galway, um, the Old Galway Diary. And he believes that everyone has a story to tell. And there's something similar in relation to an item because an item, an artifact, whatever it is, it's always an invitation for somebody to share their remembrance of times past. And the people who come into us will say, be it, they can be coming in with anything. And it's a case of, we want this so that future generations will understand what the past was like and why it was important and why this item was particularly important. I suppose we'll say like I was talking earlier about the whole area in relation to emotion and that type of thing and trying to engage in the emotion. And even if you look at, we say the whole issue of branding and marketing and that type of thing, people will actually realize and state that emotional campaigns, they work harder, they drive sales and they drive advertising effectiveness and pride and price. An artifact for us helps us tell the story that much better because it's the physical incarnation of the story that we're telling. And we're you, we don't use it obviously to drive sales, but it might make something more attractive, but it's actually to get that resonance, to get that buy-in because so people can talk, it allows us to talk to people in a language that is common to everybody. And then sort of like engages in relation to communications. We find that telling a story or bring telling that this, or if we say that this is an item is important, people will say it's important because we're telling you it's important. But if you actually t explain to them why this dress is important, for example, one item that we have we have in the collection is um, belongs to a girl who uh, left Ireland in 1912 on the Titanic, and she didn't want to use she didn't want to bring this particular dress with her, so she gave it to her best friend. And then I think suddenly when you start talking about sort of interpersonal uh, connections with an item that everybody knows somebody or so many of us know, we say people who've been affected by immigration, about people leaving home, about we say the likes of the American wake and that type of thing. And just suddenly it all becomes manifest in the item that you see in front of you. And I think that's why the artifact is so important because it gives us that basis. It's almost the springboard to tell a story. And of course, the important thing about telling these stories is that we need guardians. And that's why this is, we say, a new panel that we've actually just introduced into our permanent exhibition over the last number of months. We just actually brought it in uh, for Heritage Week there. And this is, I suppose, to give due deference and due recognition to the likes of members of the Archaeological Society to the members of the Old and Dock Society and those private individuals who give items from their own personal past that mean that so much to them and has a, we say, per personal relevance and resonance to their own a sense of identity. And that they recognize the importance of passing it on so other generations know those things and can appreciate those things that affected them. We were talking about this at the office there earlier today. And if you think about it, so many items that we have today are so disposable. Fast fashion, um, so much of what we eat, what we wear can be easily thrown out. It doesn't make, we say, we, we no longer get shoes fixed for the most part. We buy a new pair of shoes. If we've got clothes, it's probably, where are you going to get a seamstress to actually say to, you, it would cost more to actually fix the item than it would cost to buy a new jacket or something like that. But also something as simple as we said, like, so we don't keep diaries. We don't write postcards. The photographs we take on our, our cameras remain on our cameras. We don't get them printed out. So we're having this debate at work, trying to figure out what in the future, for future generations, can, will we be able to show of we say Ireland of the 1990s, the 19 of the 20th of the 21st century, and that type of thing. Now I'll touch on some some of those we say later on, but it's a hugely important question. Is sort of how do we how do we how can we contextualize the present? We will be able to take care of the past, but the present is going to be problematic. 
and that's also brings us to the whole area of legacy and that's something that i'd like to work on over the next number of we'll say next number of years with organizations such as yourself because i think legacy and the whole idea of say passing forward or paying forward an affinity with the past and to make sure that i suppose a folk memory or a communal memory is communicated further Sorry, actually, I should just point out now, hopefully, will this work? Yeah, this actually, this was the, the last item that the Archaeological Society um, presented to us. Uh, it was actually in the last four years, which was from the Siena Convent in, uh, in Drogheda. So it's an absolutely magnificent piece. And we actually, one of the good things was that because we were closed for uh, during one of the lockdowns, that we were actually able to put that on display. So it's actually on display in the museum now. The most popular item in the collection is undoubtedly the Heinkel motor car. One of my abiding memories of the, of the Heinkel, some of you might remember a musician, Nihal Osulawan. Uh, he died there in the, what, in, the last five, in the last five years or thereabouts, but he was a musician par excellence and he was giving a talk in, here in Dundalk in 2001 talking about music and, and, and that and the importance of joint shock and the And as soon as he saw the Heinkel, he just practically ran over and he was like a child in a toy shop on Christmas morning or some, or was it a child in front of the Christmas tree on Christmas morning, just lit up. And this man who was, or was after performing in Carnegie Hall, was just, he was a fan, he was a child again. And the beauty of this is, that about two or three years ago, we had a man come in, he, he drove all the way up from Dublin and he had a Heinkel on a, a trailer. And we actually drove, he actually drove it into the museum with the clearance of one side of about, literally about two inches or thereabouts. The one in the foreground is the one that he drove, that he, that he drove in. I was actually very lucky that we actually had a, a scooter around the town in that. But it's, I suppose it's just a reflection of sort of the fun that brings, that an item can bring. About, let's see, I think it was about 2004, a number of enthusiasts came over from England and they drove from, I think it was Dunleary to Dundalk in their, in their Heinkels. And they parked the Heinkels outside of the museum. Within five to 10 minutes, there were queues upon queues of people just looking to have the photograph taken with the Heinkel, as well as the scooters. When, the, when the, the group came over, they were met by some counterparts in Ireland and they said, right, we're driving. They drove up the M1. And this was the time that the Mary McAleese Bridge was just after, um, was just after opening. So they're just about going over onto the, um, going over to the bridge and the lead car driven by an Irishman waves everybody down. He tells them just to pull over on the left-hand side. And all the English fellas come out and they say, this is absolutely amazing. What's going on here? And so like, you have to get your photograph taken, the, the Heinkels with the Brown Bridge. It's just after being opened. And one of the English fellows said, oh, this is ridiculous. Like, we'd never be able to do that in England. So the, the highway police would be over here immediately. And they said, the response was something along the lines of, don't worry, we run the country now. And I think sort of like, it's just what I love about the Heinkel and sort of the the grow and the, the mass that people have for it is just that it evokes a sense of fun in that. Even to the extent, and I can't, unfortunately I can't find it at the moment, but there was actually even a song written about it. And it prefaces, it's based on the fact that sort of it's Sean Lamas, it's that the workers were getting 50, uh, 50 pounds a week and um, that it was geared towards, we said people who had been made redundant in the GNR, that type of thing. So you've got this huge social and industrial and cultural history coming together in the shape of a song inspired by this car. And obviously here's just the inside of it as well. How simple, but also bear in mind the fact that it was made by the people who made the Heinkel bomber. That the fact that it lasted, we say it was only constructed here in three, over three years, makes the story all the more interesting. And some of you might actually remember <clears throat> that there was a photograph in the Irish Times there it was in the run up to Christmas 2019, uh, so the last normal Christmas that any of us might have had. And the Dublin port had actually come across a number of photographs of the Heinkels as they were basically being readied 
for export from Dublin port uh, bound for Brazil. Now, so it was just as many hinkles as you could see. Ah, yes, the Babes Old Stone. This is on our first floor gallery. And this is just an absolutely magnificent piece of carving. Now, as you can see here, it's actually, it was actually a grave marker. But the beauty of it is, if you can actually see in the middle, uh, yeah, hopefully you can see the, um, just there, there's the actual word and it's Daker. Uh, D-A, I just want to make sure that I've got the spelling. It's, yeah, Daig. D-A-I-G or D-A-I-G-R-E, which was a common name at the time. You're talking about something, we'll say, like I say, as it's described here as a cross-inscribed grave marker from the 8th or 9th century. What's particularly interesting is it's actually doubly unique. First and foremost, you've got the name actually inscribed in the cross. That is basically is unknown, unheard of. Normally it would be elsewhere, would have been out, say outside of the, the cross, not inside of it. That area would have been blank. And then the other thing here is just, if I can get the cursor working here, just you might be able to see there's a sort of a Y-shaped uh, decoration coming from there. They believe, you might be able to see it better here. This was actually, they think, uh, based on or uh, inspired by uh, metal prototypes. So again, that, that's completely unheard of. But it's a magnificent piece. And the funny thing about it is that it was discovered completely and utterly by accident. A number of men were doing some work of an evening, um, throwing stones into a JCB or into the, the digger of, the, of a JCB. And they had a, um, a set of headlamps from a car pointed in the area where they were working. And one of the men just happened to look and the light caught some of the decoration there. And they said, what's going on here? And then they discovered that they actually had an eight or ninth century grave marker. I love, if we go back to, we say the whole area, we say that obviously of storytelling and that, these two items here, um, that these two items here, this one and the next one are two food vessels, which were located, um, let me just check my notes. Uh, they were found in Carnmore a number of years ago. Um, now, I suppose we say from a, an archaeological perspective, it's described as, this one is described as an intact, simple bowl with all over ornament, including chevron bands, rosin shapes, and zigzag lines. This is described as a large, intact, lugged tripartite bowl, highly decorated with ornamental bands, mainly of co uh, of comb decoration. Now they're roughly talking about our 2000 to 1600 BC. But what I love about this particular item is just the nature of the decoration here, particularly over just this band here. It's not exactly, it's sort of difficult enough to grasp the size of it, but each of those decorations equates to the size of, we say just the, that space, just sort of like, if you can imagine sort of that you're just punching some plasticine or what, something like that, which is sort of with your baby finger. It just takes on the shape and the contour of the, say, your, of your nail on your baby finger. And I just love the idea that sort of that type of decoration, how painstaking it was done, and sort of how something was so intimately done, approximately, what we say, 4,000 years ago or thereabouts. So again, sort of, there's an element of that the archaeological description sort of misses out on the actual emotional content sort of the beauty you can imagine somebody just working away diligently at putting this decoration on and then something similar maybe with a sharp a sharp stick or something like that just put it you say doing the flex or the zigzag pattern and i think sort of does i think this is where we say where the collection can really score particularly ours because these things are so intimate so and so delicate and that they're the basis for discussion Perhaps one of the most interesting items is this leather jerkin or leather coat, which was worn by King William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne. Now, there's again, this is actually multi-layered from the point of view of stories associated with it. But we'll start with the actual, we'll say the 1690 um, beginnings of it. As you can see, it's decorated or would have been decorated. 
The story is that there was an exchange of, bat of gunfire on the eve of the battle and King William was sh shot on the shoulder. I believe it was here, because the size here equates to the size of a musket ball. His aide de camp, Colonel Weatherall, went to his uh, went to tender uh, went to went to his aid, and as a I suppose an expression of of the king's gratitude, he gave the jacket to him, so like as a as a as a to indicate his gratitude for his help. So this was passed on from generation to generation. I'll come back here. Unfortunately, as you can see, there's an awful lot of leather missing. So if we go fast forward to from 1690 to 1803, you can you have the event of Robert Emmett's um, rebellion in Dublin. And the man was running up uh, with this uh, Ravensdale house, up, running up the driveway or the avenue to, to tell the residents of the events of what the, that had gone on in Dublin the night before. And he came across two boys who were playing football, or sorry, who were playing ball in, in the garden. And he grabbed the ball and he said, boys, that's a beautiful ball here. So like, it's beautiful leather. Where, pray tell, did you get, where did you get the leather from it or, uh, to, to construct such a ball? And the response was sort of, oh, we got it upstairs um, in the garret from the jacket. Now, the obvious question then, which was, which was then asked, like, well, um, surely not King William's jacket. Now, unfortunately, the response isn't recorded, but it was probably if it, was, it happened in the 20th or 21st century, it would be a case of sort of, well, I don't know. And then cue embarrassing silence and that type of thing. What I find interesting or re resonance about this particular item is that it has, continues to have an interaction and an overlap with various aspects of Irish history because the story goes, uh, which was told to me by Lord Roden, that there was always a letter confirming its providence associated, or we say, that it was always with the jacket. And then in 1916, when the family were doing an inventory of their own papers, they couldn't find the letter. So the providence, we say the physical providence was actually, had, had disappeared. But I love this notion that sort of 1690, 1803, 1916, sort of touchstones of, I suppose, the, in the Irish, the, 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 the nation's narrative, something happens with this particular jacket. Obviously it would have been decorated, it was, we say, designed so that it would actually, um, we say, protect the rider from, we say, the elements and, and that type of thing. Um, but unfortunately the decoration has been lost, it was damaged in some, um, we say, a pipe burst that caused some damage in that. But the pipe didn't cause the damage down here, which you can see just in the, in the corner and the, we'll say the bottom right hand corner of the, of the jacket. And what actually happened was that we say, if we fast forward to 1937, we've got evidence from the Folklore Commission that there was a steward employed on the, um, on the farm. And basically he was well aware of people's interest and I dare I say devotion and interest in the, um, the jacket and then King William. So what he used to do was he'd actually give them slivers of jacket to, to various visitors and that type of thing, sort of almost like a, a, a relic from the cross or something along those lines. Um, but again, sort of just, again, sort of just how various, the story just sort of develops and develops. It just doesn't start and begin in 1690. And again, story, story, story. This is a personal one. And it's a very strange, I suppose, but a huge significance to me. This year is the 50th anniversary of the uh, Carol's All Stars. And this is the poster from the first All Stars. It was the first item that I actually saw, we say, in the collection itself when I, when I, when I first started. On day number one, I was taken on a tour of the, the galleries and taken on a tour of the, of the, star, of the, um, of the stores. And this was shown to me. And what's significant here is this item here, Liam Salmon. Uh, Liam was one of the greatest Galway footballers of all time. And what's hugely significant from my perspective is Liam and I played for the same club, but not at the same time. And I just, it was so, it just reminded me of a story that Brendan O'Hare has in, the, um, in his book, 
over the bar. And there's a story about a, um, a radio operator in World War II uh, who was actually from Galway at the time. And it was around the time of the, um, the All-Ireland football final. And the radio operator was in Monte Cassino in Italy during the battle, but it got all quiet. And then suddenly the, um, his regiment realized that his um, radio operator had disappeared. Couldn't be found for love nor money. And they put out a search because a radio operator is obviously so important. And next thing, eventually they found him. He was halfway up a tree with his radio, fine tuning it to try and get coverage of the All-Ireland football final of that day. And so there was a slight situation because it's because he deserted, he could actually have been killed and executed. But the problem was um, radio operators are were too important. So he's just left off with a, with a wrap of knuckles, a wrap on the knuckles and that type of thing. But as Brendan O'Hare says, here's the situation, sort of an Irishman in the middle of war is trying to reach out to get, get some trapping of home and that. And that's why I think this particular item is just is significant because it touches on the importance of artifacts because it all brings us back to identity and who we are and how we define ourselves and how we see ourselves. I mentioned Beatrice Hill Lowe earlier and here's the collection of items that we had actually, that we managed to purchase. Down here is the bronze medal that she, that she won. These are items that she, or we say trophies, medals, awards that she had won over time. This, as you can see, has a bar from 1907. Now, if you look very carefully, and I, it would have, would have been a good, good idea if I'd actually have a photograph of Beatrice. This is her at White City in the competition uh, in full draw. Now, what she actually has here is a, she's wearing her yard, yard book and she's got a quiver as well. It was only sort of on closer inspection that we actually realized that this quiver here is the item that she has, uh, that she actually wore to the Olympic finals. And this is her yard book here. This is actually a silver trophy or a, a trophy. And as you can see, it's monogrammed BHL. And here's the, the bronze medal. Um, again, sort of coming back to sort of, I suppose, the tangibles of, um, of museum collection and that. This is hugely significant for a variety of reasons. I suppose it's, it's our trench art collection. And trench art was hugely important at the time because for a variety of different reasons. It was an opportunity for um, soldiers who were injured and who were getting some form of occupational therapy and that. It was a way of actually keeping them busy and keeping their minds focused on that. Because you've got so much spent ordnance, the ability to actually get use bullets, shrapnel, um, sh spent shells and that type of thing. All of these items were, were in huge abundance. So basically what happened was that soldiers in particular, but also would say people living in the, would say in the, the, in the vicinity of a particular battle or whatever, took to make these things into craft and decorated them and sold them. So it became sort of like a very, like a cottage industry. But as you can see here, this actually says victory. This is something like, we'd say maybe like a daffodil or something like that. So it could be something that would say that a soldier might send home to his family uh, on the home front and that. And as you, you can imagine sort of like, just like just while you're just waiting for to be told to go over the top or whatever, you're just waiting for the shelling or whatever, just to kill some time, you start decorating, you take something in your hand because it's better than doing nothing. And as you can see here, this is the bottom of a shell. It's a four and a half inch houseter. And if you just look here, you can actually see some of the decoration that's been done. Some of them were a wee bit saucy. So along the lines of, we say maybe like um, a, uh, a postal card from, we say 1950s or 1960s um, Britain and that, but it was all just a variety of different things just to keep men busy. But these two items are hugely significant. This is a rum tot, and this is where the rum was stored and poured. And effectively what happened was that the rum was dispensed, 
by the tot to the to men just before they're waiting for the whistle just to go over the top just to fortify and calm the nerves and that and i suppose really sort of the the chilling thought about it is that by giving the um, the soldier this drink to, to fortify and to calm the nerves was arguably and i'll use the term advisedly sort of the last piece of human kindness that our, our, our generosity that some of these men actually uh, experienced before they went and met their maker and again sort of just it's such a simple item you'd gloss over it you wouldn't possibly even pay it any attention but again it's like everything else when you get in the hands of the right guide in the hands of the right presentation that type of thing these things have a larger significance than they actually might have a first appearance and again just sort of a slight variation on the the angle on that the SS Dundalk <clears throat> um let's see was this 1918 so you're talking about 103 years ago the SS Dundalk was sunk um just a couple just what six weeks not even six weeks before the end of World War One um I think it's always think it's hugely important. I can always imagine sort of the, the, the psychological impact of losing a ship that's we say central to we say I suppose the the lifeblood of an area, particularly when the ship is actually named after uh, holds the same name as the as the um, the town from where it's based and where it operates. And again, sort of an item from from the uh, from the SS Dundalk. What I love about this particular item is, and this, again, it comes back to the story. The ship went down very quickly after being struck amidships by, um, by two torpedoes. And if you think about that, somebody in the wheelhouse had the presence of mind when all else, when basically the, the ship was sinking, to grab the ship compass and to make make way, uh, make it, to head immediately to go to the, we said the, the lifeboat. Because actually, if you just think of it to make sense, that at least when you're in the lifeboat, you know which way is north, you know which way is south, you know at least what direction you're going in. So the likelihood of being, of so getting help in that is increased. You're not just going around in circles. And it's just that presence of mind. Every time I come back to it, I can't help, I can't not be just say, find myself being stopped and like just to admire that grace under pressure, that ability to think, sort of not just to get myself out of here, but actually this is going to help as many of us who have actually survived. I just, I, I just, I just, I just stop. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. The next item then is just the um, the address to to, to Ms. Sarah Toll, who did so much to fundraise and to help and assist those people who are affected by the sinking of the SS Dundalk. And one year after its sinking. That this presentation was made to her, signed by the people, um, signed by so many people who actually just treasured and appreciated the support that they got from uh, via the efforts of Sarah and so many others, just to actually maybe sort of just help them recover and get their lives into some type of um, I don't know how what you would say to, to make to make good of a very bad situation. And just sort of that we say like some to, to grasp some form of normality in that. I spoke there earlier about we say maybe looking at the future in that. And I suppose one of the things is I suppose the beauty of we say maybe of, of having some items that are digital is the ability to record history as it happens in that. To all intents and purposes, this is a very boring photograph. It's just actually Woody's, um, I think it was around May of last year, just as the country was beginning to take its first steps from the first lockdown. So I went up to Woody's purely for research, of course, just to, say, just to, to record some of the things on display. So like, obviously we've got the COVID yellow signs. We've got the two meter gaps, that type of thing. We've got the idea of people queuing in that. And as I took the photograph, this car drove by and I timed it perfectly. And I was very lucky because as you can see, it's an unmarked 
well, I say it's um, it's just it's indicated as being a guard vehicle, um, but it just doesn't have the lights. And obviously, it was just a case of just that the guards were going around, just making sure that there was nothing untoward happening and that people were obeying the various rules and regulations. Of course, you'll remember at the very at the start of the first lockdown, all of these um, rumors going around that how the car or the guards were commandeering or we say taking a variety of car whatever cars that were available from stockists so that they could basically just drive around just to make sure that they had enough vehicles. Um, for fear something was going to happen and that type of thing. The thing about it is we say history, I suppose the thing about history is that sometimes you don't actually recognize something as being his historical until the opportunity is well and truly gone. And this, I think, photograph just actually just hits the nail on the head as to just sort of the, the importance of recording what's going on at this moment in time. Now, some of the things that we've we've developed, we say like um, a COVID box where items associated with, we say, an, an awareness campaign or do you remember there, we say the likes of um, the virtual hug that Adam King had from the, uh, the, the toy show last year? bits and pieces like that sort of that will that you hopefully that we'll never see again but it just gives an indication of it of the temperature and of the nature of the time and that um so bits and pieces like that i even came i came across a um what was it it was a, a birthday card it was an invitation to a uh a, to somebody for the birthday but every we said well it was a socially distant birthday but again, just sort of those things that will be touchstones and sort of when we're talking about, we say, the COVID years in, in, in a decade or, or, or so, that those small bits and pieces that, that will evoke the memory and allow us to tell our, we say, our children and grandchildren, yes, do you remember that? And do you remember this? Do you remember that? And so it wasn't like that in my time. The Trinity, as I call it. We have, obviously, the largest ar artifact in the building. The building itself, the Heinkel motor car, which was we said the one that was driven down from Dublin, and the Coulter poppy. So this beautiful notion of three elements of heritage and habitat, and I suppose and history coming together. Um, I came across something there by a man called let's, let's get his name Emmer Eston Evans. He was a obviously he was a Welsh historian. And basically, he was saying that studies of his of heritage can assist a fuller understanding of the distinctive, uh, what's the distinctive and continuing character of Irish history, and it's the interplay of these items, and that's why the artifacts are, are so important. So, if we do everything right, we'll be the County Museum Dundalk, and hopefully, we'll do it exactly as it says on the tin. I'm going to leave our contact details up here. So if anybody wants to get in contact with me directly because they might have something that we might be interested in or they think that they might be interested in or they might be just looking for a bit of information, please, there's our, there's our contact details. So thanks for your attention. I hope you haven't bored you to tears or anything like that. And um, if you have any questions, I gladly entertain them. Thank you.